Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Were you planning on buying the boat? Well, we didn't really have the money. Calling Skylar DeLeon a sociopath is probably an insult to sociopaths. Jennifer DeLeon is manipulative. She's bossy. The two of them meeting were like fire meeting gasoline. You were able to fool him? I think so. You were that good of a liar? I, I hate to say, yeah, but I think so. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. What would compel a mild-mannered young father to not only brutally kill two complete strangers, but involve several people in the plot? When he revealed his reasons, was he telling the truth? Okay, on to the show. Tom and Jackie Hawks were living the retired life on a 55-foot yacht named the Well-Deserved. The yacht was well-deserved. They had both worked hard for 30 years, and the boat was Tom's dream. Jackie was Tom's second wife, and the couple had been married 17 years when Tom took an early retirement in 2002. Tom had two sons from his first marriage, Ryan and Matthew. When Tom and his first wife divorced, he raised them, and they even called Jackie mom, despite their mother still being alive. Tom had been in the Air Force and served in Vietnam. When he returned, he got a job as a probation officer, where he worked until 2002. Tom and Jackie loved their yacht, and Tom kept it in immaculate condition. An avid fitness buff, Tom even figured out how to work out on the yacht by lifting weights on the back deck and by doing pull-ups on the side of the boat. Their retirement plan was cut short, however, with the arrival of their grandson. When Matthew announced he was going to become a father, the couple decided it was time to live closer to their growing family. They put an ad in a popular boating magazine and then waited to try to sell it. In early November 2004, it appeared they had a potential buyer. They took the yacht to Catalina, meeting up with Tom's brother Jim for one last outing in the well-deserved. The next day, they were to meet with the potential buyer. A wealthy child actor was all they were told by their friends. On November 15, 2004, Tom and Jackie allowed the potential buyer a sea trial, which is essentially a test drive of a boat. During the sea trial, Jackie phoned a friend and left a message that they were still at sea. This was the last that anyone would ever hear from either Tom or Jackie. On November 16th, when he could not get in touch with his parents, Ryan called his uncle Jim, Tom's brother. Jim had been a chief of police for Carlsbad Police Department, and he agreed with Ryan that it was unusual for them not to contact anyone. Jim went to the harbor off of 15th Street in Newport Beach and visited his brother's boat. First, he notices that the dinghy used to transport them to the yacht was not tied down properly. Additionally, the motor was still in the water. Knowing his brother's boat routine, this did not look right. Things looked worse once he got on the well-deserved. There was a towel hanging out of a porthole, wetsuits just thrown about, and the electronics were not covered by a tarp. This was not like Tom and Jackie. They loved their yacht and showed it that love by taking care of it regularly. Finding paperwork on board that indicated the sale had happened, Jim took out a business card and left a note for the new owners. In the note, he identified himself as a former police officer and the brother of Tom. He said he would like to speak to someone because no one had heard from his brother in a few days. Surprisingly, he received a call back from a woman who identified herself as Jennifer DeLeon. She was very nice and said she had been trying to contact the Hawks as well because she and her husband had questions about the yacht they purchased. She also said she wanted to make sure Tom and Jackie got their personal property that was still on the well-deserved. She told Jim his brother and sister-in-law said they were going to Mexico. On November 17, 2004, Jim went to the Newport Beach Police Department and filed a missing persons report. He explained he had already done some legwork as a former cop 
and something was not adding up. Investigators looked at the report and agreed something was amiss. The investigators and family began retracing Tom and Jackie's last known movements. To do this, they had to reach out to the buyers of the yacht. Skylar de Leon was a small-boned, 25-year-old male who told the Hawks he had once been a child TV star on the Power Rangers. He also told his friends he had once been part of an elite squad of Marines and had been a sniper. The truth about Skylar was far less grandiose. He had been on the Power Rangers, twice, as an extra. He had also acted in some commercials as a child, but he couldn't remember his lines, so his career in acting ended before it really began. Skylar had been born John Jacobson Jr. His father, a small-time drug dealer, had raised him and forced him into acting so he could take all the money he earned. Skylar said he wasn't man enough for his father, so when he was old enough, he joined the United States Marine Corps. Unfortunately, after about 15 days, he took an unauthorized absence and was charged as being absent without leave or AWOL. A little over a year later, he was discharged from the Marines, less than honorably. After his discharge, he petitioned to change his name from John Julius Jacobson Jr. to Skylar Julius de Leon, citing his father was a bad man and he wanted to distance himself from him. When Skylar was done with the military, he took a job as an appraisal contact for a mortgage lender. Again, this was short-lived, as he was arrested with two of his co-workers, burglarizing another co-worker's home in Anaheim. Skyler had a gun and plastic flex cuffs on him. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to three years probation and one year in jail. He was allowed to do work release, which allowed him to hold a daytime job and report to the jail each evening. He had to pay $70 a day for this privilege. Skyler's in-laws paid the monthly $2,100 bill for this. While in jail, he met Alonzo McChain, who was a jailer. He told Alonzo all about his service in the elite Marine squad, how he had made a ton of money with real estate, and that he had been a child actor. Alonzo fell for it, and the two became friends, hanging out, having pizza, and talking about a big score. Skyler also met John Jarvie in jail. John kept in touch with Skyler when he was released in December 2003. John had served a four month sentence for counterfeiting and shared a cell with Skylar at night. After his release, he started trying to raise $50,000, refinancing his condo and pawning his van. On December 27th, he told his mother he had an exciting new business prospect that he hoped to close that day. He was going to Mexico, he said, with a friend. That afternoon, John was found on the side of a highway just a few miles outside of Tecate, Mexico, his throat had been cut. Coincidentally, Skylar was checked into jail late that night by Alonzo McChain. Later, it was determined that Skylar had contacted a cousin and asked him if he wanted to go surfing in Mexico. His cousin arrived at Skylar's house, and Skylar asked him to drive his car. He gave his cousin a cell phone and contacted him periodically throughout the day. They went to the surf site, but once there, Skyler said he needed to go to the bank. The three men went to the bank, then Skyler drove a separate vehicle to a desolate area, where his cousin caught up to Skyler and John. His cousin said John was getting out of the vehicle with something on his face, but he appeared very relaxed. The cousin left and went to the surf spot, where Skyler later joined him. Skyler was alone and wearing a different shirt. Before he had gone to jail, Skylar had met Jennifer Henderson online. They chatted online before finally deciding to meet at a mall for their first date. Jennifer's friends were confused about the relationship. According to family and friends, Jennifer was loving, kind, generous, trusting, and religious. These same people described Skylar as irresponsible and manipulative. They said he was not truthful about things. For instance, Skylar told a female friend that he was a hermaphrodite and needed to have a sex change operation because his uterus was growing and becoming cancerous. 
Even though they had hit it off quickly, Jennifer began to think maybe he wasn't right for her. Then, through the grapevine, Jennifer heard Skylar had a motorcycle accident and began caring for him. The relationship resumed, and within a year of meeting, they were wed. They held two ceremonies, an informal one on the beach and then a much larger formal wedding. Jennifer, a hairdresser, became pregnant quickly. They lived in a garage attached to her parents' house. This makeshift apartment had no kitchen and no bathroom. When their oldest child was a little over a year old, Jennifer got pregnant again. At the time of the alleged purchase of the well-deserved, Skylar and Jennifer were in debt by almost $100,000. In July 2002, Skylar purchased Jennifer an engagement ring that cost $10,000. Jennifer's parents paid off the credit card bill. Jennifer stood by Skylar while he was in jail. Skylar's sentence was up in April 2004, and he was released from jail. By this time, he had been questioned about John Jarvie's murder, but had not been arrested. In October 2004, Skylar asked his scuba instructor if he would drive a boat while Skylar made some people disappear. He asked the instructor how to make a body sink. Skylar also talked to Alonzo and asked him if he wanted to make a few million dollars. Skylar told Alonzo he was a hitman, but only killed bad people and kept their money. On November 1st, Skylar called Tom Hawks, and they spoke for about eight minutes. Skylar and Jennifer began talking to real estate agents and accountants, looking for a home in the $2 million range. Skylar and Jennifer told the accountants that the money was coming from a drug deal. Basically, he had held some drugs for someone and went to jail for it, and now he was being paid for his trouble. Skylar then purchased stun guns and handcuffs. On November 6, 2004, Skylar and Alonzo met with Tom Hawks, who took them to the well-deserved. Skylar and Alonzo had planned on killing Tom and Jackie on this day, but the plan changed when Skylar saw how physically fit Tom Hawks was. Skylar chatted with Tom and Jackie, explaining he was married and had one child and another on the way. Skylar could tell Tom Hawks was uncomfortable with him and did not believe he could purchase the yacht. He arranged for Jennifer to come to the dock with their baby and meet the Hawks. After meeting Jennifer and the baby, the Hawks were more talkative and comfortable around Skylar. On November 14th, Skylar and Jennifer created a durable power of attorney in which Tom Hawks gave Skylar general power of attorney. Skylar was also in talks with Orlando Clement and Myron Gardner to find another man who could overpower Tom Hawks. This man was John Fitzgerald Kennedy, a founding member of the Long Island and St. Crips. Skylar, Alonzo, and John met Tom Hawks at the dock, and Skylar introduced John as his accountant. The men went to the well-deserved on Tom's dinghy. Once on the well-deserved, Skylar asked to borrow a wetsuit so he could inspect the hole. He did this and then got back on the yacht and changed back into his clothes. John faked seasickness and went down below to the bathroom, and Tom followed to see if he could help. Skylar was fast on his heels. Jackie and Alonzo were in the galley. Jackie heard a disturbance below and yelled out, What's going on? At this point, Alonzo attempted to use the stun gun on Jackie, but she fought him off. He finally managed to get her subdued and handcuffed. Tom and Jackie were both dragged onto their bed, both handcuffed. Jackie said, Skylar, why are you doing this? We trusted you. You brought your wife and your kid. You had them here. How can you do this? We trusted you. Jackie started crying and said she didn't want to die. She wanted to see her grandson. Tom and Jackie's mouths and eyes were duct taped, but then they were individually taken upstairs to sign paperwork. Skylar demanded they sign and provide a thumbprint, and if they did, he would let them go. After they were done, the Hawks were left on the bed, while Alonzo watched over them. He said Tom stroked Jackie's hand and tried to comfort her, as she cried, saying she wanted to see her grandson. Skylar entered points into the yacht's GPS, and then called Jennifer several times. He and John also retrieved an anchor and some rope, 
and took to the back of the vessel. Eventually, the hawks were brought up again and to the back of their yacht. They were tied together with Jackie's back to Tom's chest. Tom, realizing what was happening, lashed out and kicked behind him, landing a blow to Skylar that launched him into a deck chair. John Kennedy hit Tom in the right temple, which left Tom stuttering and unable to stand without Jackie's assistance. Skylar then threw the anchor overboard, and John pushed the hawks off their yacht. Jackie's head hit the yacht wall, and then the anchor dragged them out to sea. Today's episode is brought to you by Beekeepers Naturals. Beekeepers is on a mission to reinvent your medicine cabinet with clean remedies that actually work. You and your family deserve to feel your best all day, every day, which is why Beekeepers Naturals creates clean, science-backed remedies that naturally support your daily health, like Bee Soothe Cough Syrup, the truly clean cough syrup that helps you get back on your feet. I try as much as possible to keep my voice healthy by using Bee Soothe for throat and immunity support, and the flavor is so much better than your standard cough syrup. It's naturally powered by nature's most powerful immune supporters, pure buckwheat honey, elderberry, chaga mushroom, bee propolis, and olive leaf extract. But Bee Soothe Cough Syrup isn't the only beekeeper's product I love. My family is obsessed with Bee Lixer Brain Fuel. It helps to naturally beat brain fog, find your flow, and deliver your A game. We all take one shot first thing in the morning to stay energized, on task, and focused all day. So. Are you ready to upgrade your medicine cabinet? This amazing cough syrup always sells out quickly, so don't delay. Get yours today. Check out Beekeepers Naturals to try Bee Soothe Cough Syrup and discover other clean remedies your family will love. You can save 15% on your first order today by going to beekeepernaturals.com slash true crime. That's B-E-E-K-E-E-P-E-R-S-N-A-T-U-R a-L-S dot com slash T-R-U-E-C-R-I-M-E to get 15% off. Meet your new medicine cabinet with Beekeepers Naturals. The yacht was turned around and John took a beer and a fishing pole to the back of the yacht and began fishing. Skylar made and received several calls with Jennifer, with the last one being around 1.30 a.m. when Skylar was back in Long Beach. On November 17th, Jennifer asked her father if he wanted to help them clean the boat. He agreed, and she asked him to stop to buy bleach and trash bags. When he got there, Jennifer removed the Hawks' belongings from the bedroom. They kept some of them and donated others. The Delions pointed out which car belonged to the Hawks, and Jennifer's father asked why they couldn't take it if the Hawks left it. So he drove the Honda CRV home. The next item on the agenda was to get the documents notarized. Skylar contacted a friend who put him in touch with a notary. The notary met Skylar and Jennifer in their hotel room. Her normal fee was $50, but she was paid $2,000 to backdate the documents to November 15th. The Delions went to the Hawks' bank in Arizona, presenting the power of attorney documents, but the bank manager refused to accept the documents and would not release anything to the couple. In the bank security video, Jennifer was grinning broadly. On November 26, 2004, Skylar and Jennifer drove their car and the Hawks' car to Ensenada, to a friend's house. Skylar gave the Hawks' SUV to his friend and then tried to open a bank account in Mexico. Unsuccessful, they drove home. On the same day, Skylar contacted the bank in Arizona to see if they had received wired funds and the power of attorney. The bank manager knew of the Hawks' disappearance by this time and started questioning Skylar about where he was. Skylar became nervous and hung up. Jennifer called Jim Hawks on this day, apologizing for being short with him the last time they spoke and asking him to have Tom or Jackie call her or Skylar. 
Jim said the family was worried and was going to file a missing persons report, although one had already been filed. A few days after all of this activity, Skyler spoke with a specialist in yacht escrows about registering the well-deserved. He faxed paperwork over, but the bill of sale was wrong because of the power of attorney. The specialist became suspicious and contacted the police due to the unusual power of attorney. When the police first spoke with Skylar and Jennifer, they were cleaning a church in Long Beach. They questioned them separately and got different answers on certain things. For instance, Skylar told detectives they paid $465,000 for the well-deserved, but Jennifer said they paid $265,000 for it. When asked about this discrepancy, Jennifer said she lied because she was worried about taxes. On December 13, 2004, Ryan Hawks went on Good Morning America to ask if anyone had information about his parents' whereabouts and to please call the Newport Beach Police Department. Ryan shared pictures of his parents, but also their vehicle. The next day, a woman called from Ensenada and said she was looking at the vehicle. Detectives went down to retrieve the vehicle and spoke with the residents, who were speaking primarily Spanish. Finally, the detective asked if Tom and Jackie Hawks had left the car for them, and the male replied, No, it was Skylar DeLeon. On December 16, 2004, Skylar was arrested for money laundering, and a search warrant was executed on the DeLeon's apartment. Jackie's laptop and camcorder were both found, as were some papers belonging to the Hawks, videotapes, and bags from the well-deserved. On the videotapes were home movies of the Hawks until it switched to the Deleon's Thanksgiving dinner. Jennifer was arrested in April 2005 and charged with two counts of first-degree murder. She was the first one to go to trial in November 2006. During her trial, her father testified that she wore the pants in the marriage and Skylar had to ask her permission to do anything. Skylar's grandmother also testified that she had asked Jennifer why she married Skylar, and she said, for the money. Jennifer was found guilty on both counts of first-degree murder after the jury deliberated for four hours. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Alonzo Machain came forward on his own and provided all the details of the murders. As a result, John Kennedy and Myron Gardner were also arrested. Once in jail, Skyler still tried to con people. He tried to take out hits on his cousin and his father to prevent them from testifying against him. In 2008, he also tried to cut off his own penis. In a 2009 interview with ABC, he said he wrapped a sheet around it and pulled. He was found before he could finish the job. At some time after his arrest, Skylar began explaining he had committed the murders to pay for his gender reassignment surgery, for which he had made a $50 deposit a few weeks before the murders. His attorney admitted on the first day of the trial that Skylar was guilty of all three murders, but he was trying to play on the jury's sympathies so that he might get life in prison rather than a death sentence. However, this was in vain, for Skylar was found guilty on all three counts of murder and was given a death sentence. Death. That was the verdict reached by a Superior Court jury for triple murderer Skylar de Leon. The seven-woman, five-man panel deliberated for two days before determining that de Leon should die by lethal injection instead of spending the rest of his life in prison. De Leon showed little emotion when the verdict was announced. In his final arguments of the penalty phase, Deputy District Attorney Matt Murphy insisted the only proper verdict was death stressing the cold and callous nature of the crimes and the impact of those crimes on the lives of their relatives. Ryan Hawks, the son of Thomas and Jackie Hawks, who were killed by De Leon in a scheme to steal their yacht, didn't miss a day in court and said the verdict is a relief. Betty Jarvie, whose son John Peter was killed by De Leon on a Mexican highway in a murder for money scheme, said she's glad De Leon got the death penalty, but it won't bring her son back. In prison, Skylar has long hair wears a bra, and is receiving hormone treatments. In 2019, Skylar's gender was officially changed to female, in court anyway. She changed her name again from Skylar Julius de Leon to Skylar Preciosa de Leon. 
Skylar told many reporters that she was not interested in men, just women, and she wanted to transfer to a women's prison since she gets along so much better with women. John Kennedy was also found guilty of the murder of the Hawks and sentenced to death. Skylar's request for the surgery has sparked a controversy in California, with people questioning if the taxpayers should foot the bill for this surgery for a killer who was given the death penalty. Since a moratorium was placed on the death penalty by Governor Gavin Newsom in 2019, this has caused even more anger because the state will be paying for Skylar DeLeon for more years than initially anticipated. Ryan Hawks is bitter that his parents' killer is being given hormone treatments and will potentially have the surgery. He believes this sends the message that you can kill three people in cold blood and still be granted extraordinary privileges and rights. Tom and Jackie were well-loved by many. When they married, there were 150 people at their wedding. They made friends everywhere they went and lived life exuberantly. Their son Matt said of them, like a ship and a rudder, one doesn't work without the other. This was something his father always said about them. They are missed by their sons and their grandson Jace, who will never remember meeting them as a newborn, but is being told about what wonderful people his grandfather and grandmother were. Jackie's last thoughts were of Jace before she was ruthlessly thrown overboard. Okay, fan club members, as I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a positive review and rating on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. It really does help. You can find us on most social media platforms, Twitter at TCFC Pod, Facebook.com slash TCFC Podcast, Instagram at True Crime Fan Club Pod, and of course, our website is TrueCrimeFanClub.com. If you have an episode request, send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was written and researched by Susie St. John, content editing by Brittany Martinez, produced by the best in the business, Nico at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkOfDreams.com.